up too. Yeah. So how, how, how much time do you spend working on your lower register? On my lower register? Well, I've that register. Been lately this week, but normally mm -hmm. I try and do it like in my warm ups. Mm -hmm. But uh, apart from that, like I don't specifically. So the thing about trying to work on your upper register is you have to work on your lower register. You have to, you have to expand both ways. You yeah. have to keep working on it that way. Because if you only keep on trying to go up and you don't develop that bottom, all of a sudden your range is going to become, instead of expanding, it's going to just like shift up. You know what I mean? Like it's, gonna yeah. stay, it's not going to be strong. So that, you want a strong foundation so that you can play up into the upper register. <clears throat> so um, where do you go to high school again? Which um, city? Uh, Newport Richie, that's in near Tampa. Tampa, you told me that. Yeah, okay, Tampa. So, do you have to do marching band and stuff like that? I do. Alright, so, I am hesitant for to t talk to you about breathing for a couple reasons. One, is that there's a lot of bad stuff that people do about breathing, but right now you're not taking in enough air to, to support that register. And if you can't get those notes to come out and don't have enough air to do that, there's no way we're going to be able to really develop the upper upper register without more yeah. air, right? So I notice I don't have a lot of like breath control. And, mm -hmm. like, that's another thing I don't really know how to like, because I think I'm taking up, up, up enough air, but I'm not. Uh -huh. So when you're breathing, what are you thinking about? Where, where's the air going when you take a breath? Where's it going? Where's it going? It's going into my mouth cavity. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, so after after you breathe in, where, where are you f feeling the air fill up in your in your in your stomach? Okay, so there's more than just that that we can do, right? So there's a great trumpet player, Mexican trumpet player. What the heck is his name? It's evading me right now. Trumpet player it has a method book about about breathing and playing trumpet, and he talks about imagining like your torso like a Coke bottle, right? All right. So. And then you want you can fill it up when if you fill it up, a coke bottle a glass coke bottle up with water it doesn't just expand forward right it expands all, all sides on all sides you've heard this before yeah yeah okay okay so you know so we we can expand into our lower back and I, you already know we don't want to go like this when we breathe but we can still use our lungs and fill them all the way up so the problem that happens is that sometimes we think too much about breathing we get. <gasps> We get all tense, and we don't want to do that either. So I try to not think about breathing personally, just trying to make sure that we're taking in enough air to be able to support what we want to do. So <clears throat> some stuff that you can do to try to think about expanding your lung and expanding the cavity is just when you're breathing, just kind of like breathe in, and then see if you can keep breathing in. Just to kind of like stretch out. The, yeah. the lungs and stretch, stretch out the muscles there so you, you can f get used to feeling what it's like to like expand but the last thing that we want to do is to develop tension you know when we start to breathe because lots of people do like these different things like the breathing gym and like all this stuff or like sometimes in marching band they make you like breathe in for four and out for this many beats and like all this kind of like stuff and I think it's kind of not help, not really that helpful but just think about taking in as much air as you can and gently releasing it um, in a controlled way. Cool. So when you're thinking about half diminished, what do you? What's the chord scale that goes along with that? I just kind of think of just like the minor scale of the tritone. The minor scale of the tritone. So on G half diminished, you're thinking of what scale? What scale? I don't really know. I think like, I'm not really thinking of like a scale. What are you thinking of? I'm thinking of like specific notes. Okay, which specific notes are you thinking of? I'm thinking of G half diminished. It's like G, B flat, E flat, E flat. And then like, I'm just kind of like in my brain, kind of making a scale that goes along with that. Like, okay, well first of all, that, that, goes along with A, a flat major, right? Uh, yeah, and then on 
C seven you're talking about playing the minor something minor on the flat tone. The C seven. Yeah. Like a C Scale, but the whole tone scale is really not specific because it has a lot of and it just sounds good. scale to use would be if you use melodic minor up a half step from the root okay. on the flat nine. So what would that be? The melodic minor of um, half three up a half step. Yep. That would be um, D flat. Well, you mean like D flat melodic minor? Or D flat melodic minor. Right? Or C sharp melodic minor. So uh, E flat. In jazz, don't change it on the way back down. Because in classical music you would learn you it. You do, but you just play the. You would play it. You would, right, you would flip it and do the flat, the natural way on the way down, but we don't do that. So we'll just keep it the same, like we just did. So, and that's a way for you to get more specific colors. You get the flat minor, and the, and the major third. Might be a little better for you there. Yeah. So finding the way to play it with the least jumping around is the way that it's going to create the smoothest voice leading. When I say voice leading, you know what that means? Right. This quick passage from one note to the next. Yeah. Just trying to create smooth connection of chord tones between chords. Right. So we do try to finding those while you're doing sitting on the piano rather than doing the little jumping around kind of thing. You're doing some voice leading and then some jumping. So the, the more you can focus on making sure that you don't do the jumping, the smoother it's going to be when you translate it over to the trombone, because we want, we want to be able to hear those lines in our head while we're improvising over the tune. All right, all right let's jump back to the trombone here. Anyway, so you get used to like how those colors feel by going slow and, and kind of feeling our way through that. Does that kind of sequence make sense to you? Yeah. In terms of like digging into something and practicing something as opposed to like just playing. But when, when I was in high school too, like that's what I did. I just turned on the Abersol stuff and just play, 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 and I thought I was practicing. I didn't know until I got to college that... It's like steps. Yeah, that there's actually things. It's like working on an etude or something. You have to actually like work on stuff. Like it's not just going to magically get better if you just keep running it all the way through and making the same mistakes every time you go yeah. through. You know what I mean? So those are just some important things. But I think my focus is always... With, with students is to zoom in on the details and get really, really nitty gritty with these details so that when we zoom out to just playing, we've already taken care of those details. Like the hard part of the tune, like if, if that 2-5 to A is a hard part for you or the half to the part is hard. So we kind of get really nitty gritty about it so that it's easy when we go to the big picture. See how my elbow is kind of leading the way? Right. When I'm doing it, watch, watch what happens. What I'm trying to do is use more wrist and fingers than elbow. So for playing like a classical piece, you know, you want, that elbow helps to lock in the notes, right? Right. Helps to lock it in, make it nice and, nice and crisp, nice and articulate. But when we're playing, trying to go up for smoothness and in jazz, if you watch JJ play, he uses more of a throw and a catch kind of. Yeah, so what you were doing. Yeah, so I'm trying to get like that. That's where I'm trying to be as well, you know, trying to just throw and catch. So it's a different kind of hand motion. It's more of like moving your, turning your wrist forward. Okay. What you want to do is push your hand forward like this way. Keep your, so the palm is always facing that direction. Bob. 
Yeah, and see, so we're just turning it this way. But with our fingers relaxed, it looks like this. Sure. Yeah, right now you're moving your whole you're moving your whole arm. So the best thing to do is to take like a door or something. And it'll keep your elbow from moving, right? So yeah. put it up against, <laughs> literally, and then you just practice turning your hand. See how my just my hand is turning, my elbow's not moving. I'm just gonna turn your wrist that way. Does that make sense? Like this. It's weird, right? Yeah. It's weird. But when you start throwing and catching it fast like that, it actually makes it a lot simpler. But it's not something that's gonna change like in right. it's, it's something it's something just to think about and think about your slide technique when you're playing jazz versus when you're playing classical and have different technique for both. That's what I like to think about. It's having different techniques. And then go and watch some videos of JJ and of Curtis and these guys and try just try to watch how they turn their wrist.